Welcome to The Aftermath, a podcast that rips the band-aid off the collective scars of divorce, custody battles, and the trauma of family drama. Kendra Ryber and Mick Smith pull back the curtain and explore stories that put the heart-wrenching puzzle pieces together with inspiring stories, notable experts, and actionable tips. Let the healing begin. This is Mick, the Doctor of Digital, co-hosting of The Aftermath, and Kendra, the legislative advocate. How are you doing today, Kendra? I'm wonderful. How are you, Mick? I'm doing fantastic. We got a little bit warmer in San Diego now. We're going to get over 60. I know I had my winter coat on because it was in the 50s, but other than that, I'm doing fantastic. You know so, what, Mick? I don't want to hear it. I really <laughs> want to hear it. <laughs> sorry, I don't want to rub it in. So... I'm really excited about today. We have Charlie who's coming us all the way from the UK, and I'm really excited and interested in hearing everything that he has to say. So with that as introduction, we want to make sure that everyone is subscribing, liking, sharing, and especially positively reviewing the aftermath on the Apple podcast. So anything yeah. else you want to add, Kendra? And intro. Yeah, I'm just, Mick, I'm really excited. Charlie, um, Me too. you know, is what he says is pretty Parental alienation is one of the worst things you can go through. And Charlie McCready is coming to us from London, and he specializes in helping people get through this process because it's tough. And he himself has been through it just like us. And now he has a passion to help others. So he actually has a nine-step program that he's put together. So I'm hoping we can maybe hear about that towards the end. But really, the topics that we're discussing today are going to be around helping your children through it. Um Re reducing the damage and then restoring your own mental health. Three important points that we know are really critical. So yes, I can't wait to get Charlie in. And with that, let's make sure we bring in Charlie. So Charlie, you're listening in and we'd love to welcome you to the program. Thanks for taking out some time to chat with us today. Thank you very much, guys. Good, good, good. Well, and good day, Mick and good day, Kendra. Lovely to have, uh, it's lovely to be invited here. Thank you. Yes, thank you for joining us. We're looking forward to this conversation. <laughs> so, <laughs> as we were joking a little bit before we started the podcast, Charlie has a twin, and we're hoping we have the right Charlie here that can talk about <laughs> parental alienation with us. So, <laughs> you do, you do. You're in good hands. <laughs> Perfect. You're the expert. Okay, great. <laughs> That's a good start. <laughs> Well, tell us a little bit about, you don't have to get into all the details of your story, but tell us a little bit about how you developed a passion for helping others and how this kind of started with you with exploring what alienation even is. Yeah, so I, I like many people, uh, found myself being confronted with alienation back in 2013. Um, I had two, two children at that point in time. I was married to somebody who was very narcissistic. And I kind of always knew during that relationship that if I was ever to leave it, uh, that this was going to be damaging for the children. But I had to exit it. And like, like many of us, we don't really have a choice about this. Um, and it was really at the point in time of divorce that, that my wife, my ex-wife, uh, made a concerted effort to stop me from seeing my children. So I, I went through periods of no contact. I went through periods of limited contact. Um, but I also spent a lot of time trying to understand what was going on. I did a lot of research. Um, I started building up some tactics and strategies. And over a period of a number of years, I managed to rebuild that relationship with my children, which is the positive side of this. But, you know, I appreciate that some people do have contact. Some people don't have contact. But in either instance, there's, there's a lot that you can do to help yourself and help your children. Sure. And I think, sorry, Mick, go ahead. I was just going to say, yeah, just kind of jump in because now looking up what you had done and what you're up to, you have a nine step program. So for those of us who said we've dealt with really difficult people, are you telling me that in nine steps you can help people? It's awesome. I got to hear all about this. That's what I'm really curious about hearing. <laughs> well, I mean, it, Effectively, it, it builds, and, and I'm very happy to talk about sort of broadly as well as the program, but, but what the program does, it, it takes a holistic approach because I think you need to address three things all at the same time. Okay. So, so the first one is you really need to get into the kind of the experience and uh, understanding what your child is going through because we tend to look at it from our own perspective. 
And, you know, as we're going through this, we're feeling, you know, loss, we're feeling anger, we're feeling things like injustice. And so when we're engaging with our kids, we're, we're trying very hard to kind of correct all of those things. And, and actually, that's not helping the kid. Um, so understanding their perspective is really, really important. I'm sure we'll go into more detail about how counterintuitive uh, alienation is. So that, that's a big part of what the program does. The, the second part is you really need to understand what's going on in the alienators' heads mm. because they, they tend to be very, very similar characters. And it's quite weird that, you know, although everybody has a very broad range of experiences, there's so much commonality between what we experience. And that's great because it kind of gives us a framework that we can use and adapt mm -hmm. to our particular situation. Mm -hmm. but, but once you understand some of the basics, like the, these people that you're in a relationship with a long time, they now, frankly, they hate you. And they're on a mission to hurt you as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And because they themselves are, they're quite insecure, quite vulnerable people, typically. That's not how we experience them. We experience the individual who is actually terrified inside of themselves. So the way that they, they counteract that is they are very bullying. They are very controlling. They are very mm -hmm. manipulative. Um, but also, they're terrible parents, and they don't care about the children. And the children are just a, a mechanism to, to hurt us. So you really need to get into the, the alienator's head so you can start getting ahead of, you know, one step ahead of them. Mm -hmm. um, and then the third, the third component is, is you. And this is the bit where so many parents make probably the biggest mistake is that they are so focused on trying to help their child, which is very, very important. They forget about themselves. And so they're in this kind of emotional, well, they're on this emotional roller coaster that the alienator has put you on because, you know, you're now feeling, you're, you're grieving the loss of your child. You're feeling mm -hmm. anger, you're feeling frustrated, you're feeling worry and guilt. And, and the alienator put you there, but you're now self-perpetuating that process no. because the alienator's kind of walked away at that point in time. And it's up to you to get yourself back off that roller coaster and you have to give yourself permission to be able to do that. So basically, in the nine steps, takes you through what some what is a very complicated area and helps you to start getting into the mindset of the kids helps you to start getting into the mindset of the alienators and then helping you to rebuild your own mental and emotional resilience in a nutshell so that's, that's great I've said quite a lot there with, without giving you guys the opportunity to talk no that's absolutely great i'm i'm glad you're explaining a little bit of that um I think it's very inspiring into our audience, maybe for them to understand how big of a gap that you had, that you had limited or no contact with your children, how many years, and then just being an inspiration on how you did reestablish contact and what that looked like after you did all of your education. And then I think we'll drive it, dive into the education, those three points. Cool. Yeah. So, so it was different for both of my my children. One of them was 14 at the point in time that I separated. The other one was 16. Um, and the, 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 older, the older child had the benefit that she was quite quickly, um, she went off to university. So she was kind of out of, the, out of the way of her mother's influence. Whereas my younger child was in the home for a longer period. So she was more mm -hmm. affected by the alienation process that was going on because my older child, basically what's happened to the alienators is they monitor everything that the children do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, some, some of the alienating parents monitor telephone calls. They look at text messages and where they're coming from. I mean, they, a child has to explain every, every kind of act they're doing, where are they going? Who are you seeing? And so when they leave that, that environment, if they, it depends on how badly they've been affected. But when they leave that environment, there are increased opportunities for the alienated parents to start rebuilding relationships. So I had the chance to start rebuilding the relationship earlier with my older daughter, whereas my younger daughter was a lot more affected by this process. Um, and, and so that took a longer period. And I, I actually went through probably five years before our relationship started healing more fully. Uh, and for two of those years, we just had no contact at all. And, and I went to a dinner with her to try and 
get us back onto an even keel. And we just decided at that dinner that we couldn't see eye to eye and it was quite pointless having an ongoing contact. And that was probably the hardest dinner of my life, thinking, wow, to, to heal this, this relationship, we have to give each other the space to not be hurting each other for a period of time and then come back into gently kind of getting to know one another once again. But much of it, again, was reliant upon not having a third party being being the alienator kind of interfering in that relationship. And I think I think that's one of the hardest things, in fact, for parents, because very often the alienators, they, 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 they play funny tricks. I mean, they do things like they will give the child the option of seeing the other parent whilst actively discouraging them from actually seeing the other parent. Mm -hmm. And then they turn around and they say to the targeted parent, they said, well, I can't force, you know, John or Jane or whoever to see you. You know, I've given them the choice and I can't force them to come and see you. Um, and it's never that it's never the child that, that typically says that. It's always the alienated that presents that argument. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, it's, it's very, very manipulative. It is. And I am smiling. So for those that can't see us, I'm smiling because that's my story. I, I mean, it is. And it, it, Charlie and Mick, I think you can agree. It's April. almost written by the book, right? Yeah. It's just identical stories. Like if you start talking to people, it's the same thing that you hear over and over. And so I'm really interested to dive into the psychology of mm -hmm. this today because I think there is the legislative part of it. Yeah. And that's what we're working on, at least what I'm working on in one area in the U.S. But this is a phenomenon that is across the world mm -hmm. and it's psychology, Right. And so I'm really inter interested in diving into your three topics and spending a lot of time on a parent's mental health and taking care of themselves, because I think that is something that lacks. And that's so hard to see. Like you said, we're always so involved in our kids and we're always trying to provide for our kids. And when they're taken out of our lives, what we experience and the grief. And I tried to explain it to someone when I was doing a, a, a guest when I was a guest on their podcast the other day that it's almost like your children are dying over and over because the grief that you're experiencing, if you get to see them for one time and then you don't see them for a long time, it's just that grieving period over and over. And it, it really does wear on you emotionally. So I'm excited to dive in. Yeah. I mean, ju ju just in terms of, of kind of building upon that, Kendra, the, we, we end up in an absolute mess. Mm -hmm. Because we, we go through, in fact, what, what I use on the program is I use the, um, a change curve that Dr. Kubler-Ross uses for bereavement. Because we sure. go through an almost similar process. First mm -hmm. of all, there's, there's shock. Then there's denial. Then we go through anger. Then we go through bargaining with God or, you know, whoever, the universe. And basically saying, I promise to do anything, providing you give me back my children. Yeah. And then we start coming out and into depression and ultimately into acceptance but it's not as you say it's not a normal acceptance because we're not we're not grieving in the same way that we grieve for somebody who dies and th this actually is probably one of the biggest problems for the people around us because although this is happening to millions of people around the world it it is still not understood by pretty much everybody we know so we end up feeling hugely isolated because because nobody can support us and you know the social services cps the court system the police the schools mm -hmm. our families you know no nobody understands it nobody and a lot of people actually start thinking in their own heads that we have got something wrong with us you know why are we such a bad parent sure. yes. that, and particularly for, for for women you know why is she such a bad because d dads have got a bad rap anyway but you know why is why does a mother not have her child you know and it, and the point is you, you're a great mum kendra and, and mick you're a great dad but we we other people don't see that all they see is kind of the the fallout of uh, of what's happening so yeah we we end up having to deal with this problem pretty much ourselves because if it was a normal bereavement uh, people know how to cope with that they know what you're going through they know how to comfort mm. you but in this instance, you, you are just left on your own. And also the grieving process is so different because you're grieving 
the loss of the time that you're missing with your child right now, but you're also grieving for the future time that you're potentially not going to have with your child. But it's, it's so hard for, for the parent because you've got all these other emotions going on. You're feeling guilt that you haven't done enough. And the reality is we all do our absolute best, but we still feel really guilty about it. We're also worrying about what's happening to our child. You know, what is happening in this household? What's happening to their grades? What's, you know, are they, are they safe, frankly? Mm. Um, and we have fear and anxiety and all these emotions just pile in on top of us. Uh, and it's, it's, we get caught in a loop, basically. And our subconscious comes into play here as well. So when we're, when we're thinking about you know, the loss and about this situation, we kind of give it to our subconscious. Our, our subconscious has got no filter. It, it just says, okay, Kendra, Mick, you want me to work on feeling grief and guilt and shame and anxiety. So I'm going to work on all of those things for you. So it does. And then it gives it back to you when you're driving your car or making a meal or watching TV or trying to do your job. And because you're now thinking about it, you've now put it back into your subconscious again. So it goes, OK, you still want me to think about this. So it carries on. Mm. And so one of the things that, that I teach people on the program is, is to break that loop because you can't start getting over this experience unless you actively, I call it conscious thinking, unless you actively start giving your subconscious something different to deal with and something positive. But this, this is where the permission piece comes in because you're on that roller coaster, you're stuck, you're like a hamster on the wheel, pedaling furiously, but you're not actually getting anywhere. And you, you need to kind of stop and say, actually, I'm a good parent. I'm a good dad. I'm a good mum. I'm a good person, regardless of what has happened. Because you are. You're all fantastic, wonderful, beautiful parents. But you've been told by somebody else that you're not, you know, and your, your kids have turned against you. And frankly, you stop believing in yourself. So you, you lose that, that self-esteem. You lose that self-confidence. And you're the only person who can, can give that back to yourself. So my, my job is to give parents encouragement to give themselves permission to get off that roller coaster and to start putting something else into their, their kind of the future path that they're going to take. And oddly, this is an opportunity in life that we as alienated parents have, which most parents don't have. Because our lives are thrown into such disarray, we have to take a really good look at ourselves. And we have to take a really good look at the things that are triggering us and how we are reacting. Because if, if, we, if we have triggers about a lack of love, for instance, lots of us have been brought up and have these emotions from our childhood. And so when our children are rejecting us or are abandoning us, all of these things come to the fore. And once you start getting into those, you, you find that we're a, little, we're a little spider's web of lots of things that have been triggering us for years and years and years, but we've never spent the time thinking about it. And this forces us to, to have a good look at yourself to say, okay, the alienator knows me really well. They're a master manipulator. They know all my triggers. They press all these buttons. And they're going to keep pressing those buttons until the time that you say, okay, that's a trigger. I'm going to get rid of that. That's a trigger. I'm going to get rid of that. And you, you literally, you disarm the alienators. But you're also disarming so many other parts of your life where the same things have been, um, they've been very, they have not acted in your best interests and they've been counterproductive for you in many other ways. Because as soon as you react to anything, you're, you're no longer doing something that's good for you. You know, you're typically going to have a poor outcome. So it, it's in an odd way, this is an opportunity mm. for, for us mm. to actually make other aspects of our life better. Again, this, this stuff is really counterintuitive. Um, the, the other thing that I try and help parents with is that very often the loss of your child, say they're in their teen years, is something that you know, you, you're not having the same level of contact with them now. But another four or five years, 
you probably would have been preparing yourself for a period that they were at college or they're going to work. And so what you're doing is you're kind of bringing that experience forwards by four or five years and going through that process early. It, you know, it, it's a lot more painful doing it in the way that we're doing it. Mm -hmm. But it's a matter of framing things differently in your own head so that you can kind of come through this in a more positive way. None, none of this is rocket science. It, to a certain, a certain amount of this just kind of tricking our own minds in order that our emotions then follow. I don't, does, that, does that make sense to you guys? 100% it does. Um, you know, you say giving yourself permission. And I think that's so true. And I love the perspective that you put it into where it's just fast forwarding their lives by a couple of years, right? Mm -hmm. And and putting yourself in that box where you're starting to separate from them, whether they're going to college or they're moving out, they're getting their own job, their own house, whatever that might be. And I never thought of it that way. And you're right, it's super painful. And I also want to give listeners the permission to experience that pain because you have to go through that pain and that period of grieving, right? And and like yeah. you're saying, there's all those different steps of grieving. But um, it's interesting because my I always choose a word for the year and it's January. So my word is happy. And so it's very top of my list right now. And I want to be happy. And I, so that relates to giving yourself permission to have mm -hmm. that life I want to experience. And I've now accepted, I've come to that point, right? I went through all of, when you were, you know, talking about the stages of grief, I've now accepted. And so I, I've given myself permission that I can be happy. I'm allowed to have a great life. Hmm. And, and actually that, that word acceptance is really critical because th I think that's the hardest thing to actually get to. And acceptance doesn't mean that you're giving up. All acceptance Correct. means is it is as it is today. Correct. And that, that applies to every other aspect of our life. You know, you are physically sitting in the property that you're in today. You don't worry about accepting it. It just, it is as it is. Mm-hmm. You know, and most most of most of the aspects of our life, they are as they are. The hardest, it, it, but it's very difficult to turn around and say, the relationship with my child has been damaged. That is the way it is today, but that doesn't mean to say that it's going to be that it can't be different tomorrow. And I think that that's one of the really important things that should help parents because when they're learning about you know, what your child is going through, you're preparing yourself for the point in time that you have the opportunities to rebuild these relationships. Because parents make so many mistakes in, in terms of, so there's, there's basically a list of do's and don'ts of, of how you communicate with an alienated child. So they don't want to talk about alienation. That's a big no-no. So don't, don't try and engage them on that. They don't want to hear about your perspective of the injustice of what has been done to you. Mm. As far as they're concerned, when you do that, you're as bad as the alienating parent. So you end up pushing them away again. Mm. You, you know, we do things like we over communicate with them. And that's again, that's our trigger internally of our sense of loss. So we reach out. And the first thing we say is, I miss you. Sure. That that's the worst thing you can say to an alienated kid. So you know what? I before I started my research, because I kind of did what you did, Charlie, and I did that. I would write cards and send text messages and say, I yeah. miss you. And then I started educating myself. I'm going, Oh my gosh, I messed up and I didn't even realize it. But it's yeah. okay. We we still have time to save ourselves. But yeah. I, that was yeah. a big realization for me because I, I didn't think of it in that perspective and how that affects them. And they they have no control over that, right? They have no nope. control over seeing you at that point in time because they feel, you know, that they are um controlled on a certain level by the alienator. So they can't. Yeah. It's, it's not acceptable for them to miss you and they can't do anything about it. So there's no reason saying it. You both miss each other. Just leave it at that. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's worth exploring that one a little bit further. So when, when, when we say something like, I, I miss you, and you link it to the communication. So f first up, the alienator is saying to them, you know, I don't want you to have a relationship with, you know, your mom or your dad. So... 
that because our kids have a very often it's a fear based relationship with the alienator mm -hmm. and the alienator when they're angry will always take everything out on the kids so our, our kids are basically trapped where they have to keep the alienator happy all of the time and very often the alienators are, are monitoring you know the communications that our kids get so letters that we send they a lot of the time they just get binned um, they look at their telephone bills because they're paying the telephone bills and the mobile phone. So they've got all this information about us. Um, and the kids being told, don't, don't speak to your mum or dad. Don't email them. Don't text them. So we then text them because we're not seeing them. Um, and the first thing we do is we text them a lot because we're feeling a sense of loss. So, you know, it's, it's not unusual for parents to text or phone several times a day. And, and we've all we've all been there, you know. I think we all go, you know, hands up, been there, done it, made those mistakes. And what the program's trying to do is it's trying to help people avoid make those, you know, avoid making those mistakes. So we over communicate. So so we're now bombarding our our lovely child mm -hmm. who is thinking, I'm I'm not allowed to receive these texts. So what do they do? They block you. Yep. Or if or if they don't block you and they are still receiving them. And then we go into the things exactly as we were saying, Kinder, and we say, I miss you. Well, it's like, wow, okay, so I, I'm the kid. I'm not allowed to receive this text. And the first thing you do is you tell me you're missing me, which makes me feel even worse about the fact that I'm not seeing you. And at some subconscious level, because, because our kids are basically splitting from us because of that, that fear bond with the alienator, you know, that they, they feel guilt about us being in a bad situation mm -hmm. so that that links back it's all these things linking together ultimately that links back to you as a parent you are you're a much so you're it's much better for your kid to see you in a good space mm -hmm. because when you say things like i miss you or you come across as being sad or depressed and i and kids pick this up in the tone of just about everything so they 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 know if if you're in a bad state but if you're in a good state that actually takes the pressure off them mm -hmm. so you being happy you living your life fully it, it takes pressure off them but also it's one of the ways that you can influence them even if you have limited contact is you being a role model because they pick up on all this stuff at a subconscious level. So if you're strong, if you're confident, if you're embracing your life, they see you as a strong parent. Mm -hmm. If you are sad, if you're depressed, if you're missing them, they see you as a weak parent. And that weak parent just kind of adds to the negative narrative that the alienators are giving them. So it's kind of your responsibility for yourself and your kids to be strong, confident, and emotionally resilient. And it's extremely hard. I will tell a very quick story that supports what you're saying. And it was a big realization for me that happened. My kids experienced their dad being sad all of the time, crying, um, not taking care of himself, passing out because he hasn't eaten. And when my youngest came to my house, he said, he started crying and said, I have to call and check on dad. Mm. And he explained to me the situation at that time. And then I, I tried to lighten the mood and I said, well, don't you ever worry about me? Right. Just as just, and he said, no, mom. He said, you have friends, you have fun, you have a good job. You, and I, it was a big realization for me of, he sees me as okay. So he's okay mm. to leave me and he knows I'm going to be okay. Even though it hurt tremendously for me. Yep. It was the right thing for me to do to present myself as the strong parent at that time, because that's what he was seeing. So I just wanted people to, to know that is true. It's so hard. It is not easy. It is so <laughs> true. <laughs> Again, this, this stuff is counterintuitive. And, and it kind of, it's it, exactly the same, Kendra. It's really, really hard to pick yourself up and, and be strong because you're also struggling with your own guilt, about doing that. And, and we have a real problem with ourselves typically in being nice to ourselves, in, in loving ourselves, in treating ourselves, in allowing ourselves to go and get on and have a normal life again. 
and at so many of the people who who come onto the program and I say you know guys are you are you back in another relationship again with anybody else and uh, particularly the mums they go well, well no you know I, I'm I don't want to get into another relationship and I have to encourage them to say well you know your your past is not the same as your future that there are some nice people out there you know, the same, the same thing applies for the dads. They, they're kind of expecting the next person they meet is going to be as horrendous as their past partner. And I go, no, no, no. But, you know, don't compromise. When you meet somebody, be very clear about who you want to meet. Make sure you meet the right person. Mm-hmm. And again, I, I can honestly say I've, I've done that firsthand. Uh, I've, I've remarried um, my lovely wife, Emma, who does an enormous amount of work. Um, with the posts and helping with the business and helping kind of with the program. She's been alienated herself. Mm-hmm. So she, she's been through this whole experience. And that was one of the things that really bonded us together. And it also helps enormously that we both understand what's going on with each other's children and can support that. Because that's another one of the challenges. If you, if you do get into a relationship, quite often the partner can't understand it. And also that extends to your family. So very often your families don't, can't help you and can you have to coach them Mm -hmm. through this process because they they don't understand it and as you learn about it you then have to tell them what you're learning and then stop them from doing things like trying to correct the injustices because they think they're protecting you and what they're doing is they're actually you know they're damaging your relationship with your kids because when they stand up for you and say, but why are you doing this to your mum? Or why are you doing this to your dad? Your kid's going, I don't want to be in this situation where I've been beaten up by granddad or grandma or whoever it is. So I'm, I'm like, I'm out of here. I'm, I'm not going to do this to myself. Yeah. But it's, it, it's um, it kind of, again, that all links back to the point you were saying before about the, the alienators interfering with the time that you do have. And they do this whole victim thing. And I don't, for the life of me, I still haven't worked this one out. How can you be the victim and the victor in the same breath? But somehow they figure it out. They do it. It's amazing. (laughs) It's 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 remarkable. And you know, I've 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 had, um, you know, it's and it's funny because they always want to claim Christmas or New Year or birthdays or graduations or any important event. You know, they, they always want to try and deny that to you. And I've had the conversations with my kids and, and they gave me a very similar response to you, Kendra, which is, but dad, you're OK. You know, we can't leave, you know, mum by herself. Yep. Well, yes, you can. You know, <laughs> you've done it to me. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know. It's It's interesting. Um, I would really love to come and talk about, come back to maybe a point if we have you on another uh, episode, but the relationship and and starting a new relationship with somebody. And just like you said, it's really hard. They have to understand or have been in that position themselves. And because everything that you go through and you experience, it's really hard and it's hard on a new relationship, Mm. but it can be done. And especially now there's millions of people that have gone through it that didn't even realize they were going through it. Mm. And and they're starting to understand and it's becoming uh, more talked about now more aware yeah i mean i, th- I think if if anybody who, who's who's listening to this and th- they're noticing that that their child is acting in an unnatural way so children will always want to have a relationship with their parent regardless of what their parent has done to them mm-hmm. and th- this is this is something the legal system should pay more attention to even where People have psychologically abused their children, sexually abused their children, physically abused their children. Those children still want to have a relationship with that parent. And it just shows the the extreme nature of parental alienation that the child feels denied the ability to have that relationship with us. Mm -hmm. Can we kind of I follow up a little bit on that? Because here's one of the things that when you experience parental alienation, you know it's real. But here's one of the unusual things that I found about it, that people define it differently. And then there are people who just deny its existence entirely, which is surprising because like Kendra and I, we both experience that we know it's real, but yet then it's not always recognized and 
especially by the counseling and psychiatrist community. They haven't formally said that it exists. So I'm curious mm -hmm. about what your definition is. And then could you expound a little bit on what parental alienation is, especially for those people who say it doesn't exist? That seems critical. Yeah. So I, I, I think if you find that your child is changing their behavior quite dramatically with you, so you can look at things like if they're losing respect for you, if they are uncomfortable in, with contact with you, if when the time they're coming and spending with you, they don't actually engage with you and they just go and hide in their bedroom, you'll probably notice things like they act differently, very differently when the other parent is uh, in the same environment as you. Um, I should have armed myself with, I think Amy, Dr. Amy Baker has got, she's got some excellent definitions. I would point anybody towards her, her, her books because she has, I think there's seven different um, kind of symptoms which are easily identifiable. And if you, if you tick the box for all seven of those, you're probably experiencing parental alienation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. Amy Baker is a great resource. But, but it's also kind of building upon what you're saying, Mick, it's, it's deeply frustrating that the psychological profession haven't yet and it's, it's surprising given the number of people that experience parental alienation. It's like, what is stopping them from recognizing that this is a, a real phenomena? Yeah. And, and it's, you know, because, because they're not recognizing it, it's not being taught uh, to the existing people, therapists, counselors, psychologists. Um, the, the, it's not, it certainly hasn't made itself into the way of the kind of the core curriculum. And the same thing applies to the legal profession. No, nobody seems to recognize this. And then it gets worse because there are some, there are some bodies and, and, you know, I'll probably risk having somebody come around and shoot me at some point in time, but, but the feminist movement, um, they have a real problem with domestic violence. Mm -hmm. And I completely empathize with that. It's a very real thing. It is terrible what is going on with domestic violence. But there is also a pocket of that movement that is saying that men are using this as an excuse to say, you know, well, my, my wife is alienating me from my child. And the women say, well, of course I'm alienating you from your child because you beat me up. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, yes, there will, that will be happening in some instances. But there will also be a lot of instances, and you know, Mick, you and me are two of them, where we were really nice. Mm -hmm. We were loving, we were loving partners, and we have been alienated. And it has got nothing to do with domestic violence or domestic abuse or True. anything of that nature. It's straightforward alienation. And I, I get very frustrated with these movements, and where possible, I do try to reach out to them and, and encourage them to be more open-minded about you know ple please don't do damage to us as a movement trying to raise awareness of parental alienation just for the sake of you know your i completely get that you would want to stop domestic violence we all want to stop domestic violence but but we need to see all sides of of this situation yeah let me go out a little bit more on a limb because uh, there is this thing called toxic masculinity you know like, well I'm not toxic just because the way I was born and even the way that I live. So why are you labeling me that way? And this is what I find is a little bit frustration from my point of view, from a male point of view. People have labeled you before they know anything about your background and none of these things existed. And I agree with you completely. Of course, if there's physical or mental abuse, I, and I get it. But even looking in my own situation, years after one of the neighbors came to my mom at one point and he said, you know what? we now realize, you know, Mick was a really good father. And I go, yeah, I know. But I mean, it took years for them to actually see that. And I go, well, yeah, it's just because I'm a little bit more reserved or I'm quiet and I'm, I don't make a show of what I am. But I mean, this is some of the things that we deal with all the time. And if I could just say well, another question I had, just if you know, because you deal with people from all over the world, probably, what's the difference in the UK as opposed to the states. And just a comment when Kendra said, we're working on legislation, we got 50 states and you have to have a movement in all 50 states. Mm. Could you 
say a little bit about the system both in the UK and England itself and how that is set up? Because that's probably a difference for a lot of people and it would be informative. Yeah. So, so well, f first of all, as, as you rightly say, the way that your legal system is created, you have to tackle this state by state. And that is going to be insanely hard to, to do. I, I wouldn't have imagined that you could get that to work at a federal level and have it passed down to the states. I think you're more likely to have to do it, you know, piece by piece. I mean, if you think about it, just to put this into context, um, Oh, I've forgotten the name of the women's liberation movement, which started in the 1960s and then in the 1970s. So women's rights have still only been accepted, I think, in 38 out of the 52 states. Something like that. Yes. The yeah. ERA and the trying to get <laughs> like, like this right. should be quite obvious stuff um, in in. But so, so the, the 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 similarities between the two is that. Uh, the, the psychological professions, the social services, equivalent to CPS, and the governmental bodies and the judiciary, none of them recognize that. So I did actually, I have actually, I have some experience of lobbying government from the job I did prior to becoming a coach in, in for alienated parents. So I have been into governmental departments in the UK. Um, I have tried to persuade ministers to do something very basic, which was we don't teach people about financial education. It, it's a life skill that everybody should have. It should be taught sure. in schools. It should be taught in universities. It should be taught to everybody. Um, but it's a difficult thing to implement as change. And it has taken 10 years to get one governmental body to actually start putting some weight and some support behind it. And I imagine it's going to take another five years before they actually make the change. And this is not what parents want to hear because a lot of people get very angry. They get very frustrated. They imagine in their head that if they make enough noise, they're going to make a difference quickly. It doesn't work that way. You have to very progressively build support amongst the people who are going to influence the decision makers and that can take a long time because the people in power typically take decisions that are not going to cause them any political damage so they want to have enough other people around them who are supportive of the idea in order that they can take it safely and if it all goes horribly wrong then they can say well all these other people you know guided me and encouraged me to do it so they tend not to make decisions by themselves so you know, in the States, I imagine it's exactly the same. You're going to have to build state by state support within the people. You know, you have to target who are actually going to be making the decisions about changing the law. What sort of support and evidence are they going to require in order that they can get comfortable that this is a real thing? Which makes it all the harder because the other professions, the, psycholo the, the psychologists, for instance, are not currently supporting it. So if they're not supporting it, how do you then take it up to the next step, which is to get it recognized in law? Mm -hmm. sure. I, mean, it's, I, I hate to be a, a, a damp squib on, on this stuff, but you know, there was a quote from, uh, I think it was the movie Blackwater, was it Blackwater? Where um, the, the, the lawyer who's been fighting DuPont about poisoning the state of Virginia, I think it was, and he, he turns around to his wife and he says, there's only one person who's going to help you through this, and that's you. Mm -hmm. And I yes. hate to say this, I hate to say this, guys, you know, we, we are in, as an alienated parent, you're in a very similar situation. You have to take the actions. You have to, to, to do the things that are going to help you and your children, because you're not going to get the support from external parties. It just doesn't exist today. That's why I love your program is because I, I think that it's a very different look at it because yes, legislation takes years if, mm. if you even make a change, right? So that's the long-term plan. In the mm. short term, let's psychologically understand what our children are going through and what we're going through and let's help ourselves through this. So there's definitely two sides to the alienation, I think. Um, which brings me back to the point that I, I think we're going backwards on your list here that we started with, but 
how can you reduce the damage it's done by the alienator? So alienators are quite predictable people. And what they tend to do is if they are angry about something, they will take it out on your child. So you need to start thinking a lot more about, right, what, what's, so I normally ask people um, when, when they're first engaging with me and they're talking about their experience of alienation, I ask them about the events or the catalysts. You know, what is it that triggered alienation? Because you can normally point towards, well, that separation is a big obvious one, but, you know, typically the relationship and the alienation, your relationship with that person has been breaking down for a lot, lot longer and the alienation process has often been going on for a lot longer as well. So one of the things that I would encourage people who, even if they don't think they're experiencing alienation, but you think you're with a narcissist, I would start taking a close look at what the dynamics of what is happening within your family. In fact, I would encourage people to think very carefully about how they are going to exit themselves from that relationship so as to reduce the damage. So if you... So the things that the, an alienator is going to get upset about include going to court. So if you don't need to take them to court, try not to, because when you take them to court, they're going to take it out on your kids. They're also going to share everything with your children. The, they basically kind of parentify your kids. They give them stuff that they should not be exposed to. And we'll have, we've all heard our kids essentially echoing what the, the alienator is saying. Mm -hmm. um, they also get very angry if you're having a relationship with your kid. So you need to tread carefully in terms of, you know, sometimes you, you need to back off a little bit from your kid in order to reduce the damage that the alienator is doing to the kid psychologically because they don't want them to see you. And, and this sounds awful, but, you know, sometimes we have to do that because we love our children. Um, but also don't do things that think very carefully about how the alienator is going to respond. So, so change your tactics so that if there's a way of reducing, you know, you want to keep boundaries, you want to be firm with alienators, you don't show you, you don't show weakness, but also you don't want to do things that is going to unnecessarily aggravate them. Because when you do, they just take it out on your kids. Mm -hmm. So th those are kind of sorts of examples of ways that you can reduce the damage that they're, they're, they're doing to the kids um, by just being a lot more tactical in the way that you engage with them. And I think at one point, whether it was right or wrong, Charlie, I decided to back off with my child because there was so many different things that he was getting punished for in the home. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. was having to, um, he, he was peeing the bed and he mm -hmm. was having to do everybody's laundry every day because he peed the bed. Yeah, um, there was Christmas gifts for all of the other children underneath the tree um, because the relationship that he had, she had some other children involved. So there was Christmas gifts for them, but none for him. And mm. at one point when he got in the car and he cried and he was telling me these things, I realized I was hurting him worse mm. by spending time with him. And so the best parent and the best way I could be a, a good parent at that point was to let him survive in that environment and not have a relationship with them at mm. that time, because I knew he wasn't getting hurt physically, but emotionally he was when he was seeing me and he was making that choice. And so yeah. that it's a different perspective to look at a, being a parent, but sometimes you have to evaluate that. It, it, it's yeah. I mean, it's one of the hardest gifts that we give our children because the, the price of that gift is, is, directly our loss and it shows that the the depth of our love for our child that we're prepared to take those sorts of actions and you know we we, sh we should not underestimate the psychological damage that is being done to our kids by the alienators that that, that our our own children are going to be taking into their adult lives you know, and how it's going to impact them in, 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 in the long term. And that that is, um, in fact, there was somebody the other day who put a post up onto my Facebook page and they were talking about the genetic nature of, parent, of alienators and narcissists. And I responded back and I said, this is not genetic. 
this is down to the fact that typically, and it's a question I ask all of the parents, what has that alienating person, what have they been through? What is the trauma that they've been through? Because very often you can take it back to something that's happened in their childhood. So they might have come from a broken home. You know, they might have come from a very domineering parent. They might have come from a background of, you know, alcohol or domestic violence. Mm -hmm. And so a young person traumatized who never deals with it, you know, and this is why I said at the beginning, they're very insecure, they're very vulnerable and they protect themselves. They don't want to repeat that trauma. So they protect themselves by being very controlling, by being very bullying. But they're actually inside, they're terrified. Mm -hmm. And also it's one of the reasons that, that they, they're kind of like Peter Pan people in the way that they mature into adults because they never fully mature. They're still quite childlike themselves and th this is one of the problems they have so you'll find that alienating parents are very poor at looking after their children they're very bad at setting boundaries they don't really spend time thinking about the kids interests what's really good for my child they let them stay out late they are quite relaxed about alcohol they're quite relaxed about drugs they don't worry too much about their grades you know they're really quite emotionally devoid and have a real inability to, to connect with, you know, with children, with you, with other people. And when you think about how scarred the alienator is, and then you look at the experience your own children are going through, you know, you, you, have, you have to be cognizant of this is going to impact the kids, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it impacts all of the kids. Mm -hmm. And so, so many children, that they, they become adults, they're no longer under the influence of these alienators, but you can't have conversations about those past experiences. So if, even when they're in their 20s and 30s and sometimes older, you can't talk about alienation because they're now scarred. That's their trauma. And if, you know, and one hopes that they then don't repeat the cycle themselves. Mm -hmm. Because it is, you can literally look back and see, you know, grandparents who traumatized the parent of your ex who then traumatized your ex who's then gone on to traumatize your kids you know and the potential for your kid now to go on and repeat that experience to some degree with somebody else and that and that is that is where the problem lies it's it is the way in which we have been parented that creates you know who we are and it creates who the alienators are it's not a genetic thing so does that take us back to answer the question of helping your children through it? And is there a way to end the cycle? Yeah, fr fr frankly, help, help, helping your children. So what I encourage the parents to do is, is remember that, well, to see things through your child's eyes. So what are they going through? So as we were saying before, they're, they're living in this very fearful relationship so them not wanting to see you is because they're afraid of the consequences and how this is going to upset the alienator uh, one of the things that that i explain to people is the when we're in a marriage with uh, a narcissist we become what i would call regulators so we regulate their mood we keep them on an even keel we keep things calm in the household for the benefit of everybody and when we step out of that role the children step into it. It's because somebody that suddenly a vacuum is created and the children become parentified. So that's that's another one of the things that that as a parent you should be looking out for, because you will notice that they start treating you differently because they're now having to parent the other person. Mm -hmm. And because that relationship has changed, they extend it to you. So it starts becoming very difficult for you to put boundaries in place with your own children and they're losing respect for you. So the power of no is, is very strong. A kid can turn around and say, I'm not going to spend power with you. I'm not going to spend time with you mm -hmm. or I'm not going to let you lay down the law in certain aspects of my life. And it really disempowers us. So we, we have to learn to keep being a parent, keep some of those boundaries up. And those are the sorts of things that really help our kids because they're still a kid. 
mm-hmm. at, at the end of the day. And also we need to remember that, you know, if they're, if they're eight, they're 10, they're 12, they're 14, whatever their age, they just want to be an eight-year-old or a 14-year-old. They don't want all of this drama in their life. Mm-hmm. It's, it's enough. They've got enough challenges being, you know, 14 and everything that that brings with it without having, you know, this war zone going on. And even if you're doing everything to help and your, your ex is causing all the damage, as far as they're concerned, you're both as bad as each other. Yep. So, it's, so, so we have to support, we really have to be aware of their needs. You have to really focus on them. You know, what are they going through? And it's back to that, that deep love for them. Sometimes they're going to, re, to, to require us to do things that feel unnatural and uncomfortable. Um, you know, often they just want to be heard. They, they want to tell us stuff that is from their perspective mm-hmm. and and our ego says no but that's not true and I didn't do that and I didn't abandon you and then I'm not that sort of a parent mm-hmm. and sometimes you just have to sit there and let them have the opportunity to to say these things to you uh, even though you know it's wrong and you you can't say anything back maybe for a very very long time and that, again that feels deeply uncomfortable for a parent having to go through that sort of support mm-hmm. There's a lot of uncomfortable in it. And a couple of things you hit on that I just want to go back to real fast is disciplining as the parent that we that we are, if you are alienated, mm-hmm. is extremely difficult mm-hmm. because you're right. I've been in that situation where trying to discipline them. At one point, my my kids were in a deposition and the attorneys were asking them some questions and said, who was the disciplinarian, you know, even before we split? Well, mom was. Well, then what does dad do now that you guys are split? Is is mom have more rules when you go to her house? Yes. Yes. She's more on our grade. She's more with rules. You know, we have to clean our room. And what does dad have? Well, we don't really have any rules. We have to do some laundry. And they're like, well, what does he do for discipline? Well, we never get in trouble. So you never get in trouble. I, I, you know, it's just, it's, it's relating those things. And my kids said at one point, they're like, well, why are you choosing to live with dad and not mom because you you explained earlier that you had a lot of fun at mom's house before so why now are you choosing to live with dad well it's just easier and that was a big realization for me too it it wasn't that they were choosing one over the other it's just easier and if you hear those two words it really ties everything together right because it's relating back to what the children are experiencing and how they're handling it and you have to be able to hear that from your kids and digest that. And it's extremely hard as a parent to let go sometimes, but sometimes you do. I, I would take that a bit further as well, actually. And it ties back to the point that Mick asked earlier about what are the signs of alienation. Mm-hmm. And one of them is that the children don't have the ability to express why they don't like the other parent. So, so actually, when they get asked a question like the one that, that they were asked there, you know, the, the simple answer is, well, it's easier. But actually, they could they, they would not wish to articulate the fact that, well, mum makes sure that, you know, we're clean and we're tidy and that we're respectful to people and that we do our homework, you know, and that we we kind of live to a set of standards that that are acceptable norms in our society, whereas dad just lets us do whatever but what what's really happening within that is that they're being asked to criticize the person that they're afraid of Mm -hmm. and they won't do it Mm -hmm. and and that's because our kids are terrified that Mm -hmm. somehow this criticism will get back to the alienator and guess what they'll be punished there'll be Mm -hmm. consequences and Mm -hmm. you know especially if they're if they're in their teen years you know you only have it doesn't take much to upset a teenager you know, the slightest look or, or turning up at school or doing anything wrong with their friends. I mean, God, we're walking on eggshells as it is. <laughs> so, you know, for, for a teenager to think, ah, oh, you know, this alienator who doesn't care about me and can be quite rough um, in, in the way that they conduct themselves, they're going to make my life a living hell. So, so I'm not going to say anything bad against them, which, which is why they won't say anything bad in courts which is why the whole voice of the child works completely for the alienators. Yes. So they basically prepped and coached the kid 
to say a bunch of stuff that's not true. And the kid's thinking, well, if I don't say that, I'm really going to get into a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the judicial system looks at that and says, well, it's quite clear. And the therapists get drawn in by this as well. It's quite clear the child has a mind. They know they don't want to be with the targeted parent. So, you know, why, why are we disputing this? Right. We'll, give, we'll give the time to the, uh, to the alienator. And very often, the other thing the alienators do is that they come up with all the false accusations. So they accuse us of various forms of, of abuse, or they might say that we've got mental problems or whatever it is. And then we have to go through this period of proving them wrong. It's not that they have to, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of weird. We're innocent until proven guilty Absolutely. in our legal system. Yep. Unless it's a false accusation, in which case you're guilty until proven innocent. And the alienator now has your kid full time, pretty much for a period. Yep. And they just get the hooks into them even further. So by the time you have proven that you are OK, the kid now doesn't want to spend time with you. They're even more damaged than they were previously. And the alienator doesn't get chastised for it. Correct. It's, another, it's another example of of how the system is so broken if if false accusations resulted and i'm, I'm glad to say actually this did happen in ireland uh, only a couple of weeks ago some woman kept accusing her husband of all manner of stuff and the judge uh, she'd done it five times and the judge got tired of this and he put her in jail yep i saw that and i was so happy for that <laughs> <laughs> because oh, you know, I've been there. It took two years for those accusations to go away. But in those two years, I lost all that time with the kids. Mm. And mm. we just we had talked to a lawyer uh, a few weeks ago, and he said protection orders are used as weapons because once you file that protection order, that separates the children from the parent and gives the alienator all of the time yeah. with that child, and that's when the brainwashing starts. Yeah, a absolutely. Very hard to recover from that if you ever do. Yeah. And as I say, in, ter in terms of that kind of the those triggers, you need to be very aware as a, as a parent of what are the things that are likely to trigger the alienator to increase the level of alienation. Mm -hmm. Because when they're angry about something, you know, they, they will just accelerate it. And the, the other thing that, that some of the parents might be experiencing we've, we've not touched on is other members. You know, it, it's not just the ex who's the alienator. When they get into new relationships, very often you suddenly find there's a stepmom or a stepdad who is completely bought in. You know, they, they, they meet this new person. They love this new person, you know, as in the step parent. They believe everything that they're being told. And then suddenly you've got two parents or two adults mm -hmm. with the same narrative to the kid. So it's like double bubble. And, and very often we're not in a new relationship because we're still feeling guilty and terrible and our life's done, you know, stuck on hold. So it's like two against one. Um, but there are other people who get involved. You know, our, our own parents get involved. Our own family get involved. And I would say 30% 30, 30 of the people that I work with have got a family member who has turned against them. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's terrible, but very often, you know, grandparents don't want to lose the relationship with the grandchildren so they make some really tough decisions about do i value the relationship with my grandchildren or do i value the relationship with my own child mm -hmm. and kind of they reckon that your own child you're going to come back to them at some point in time so so they become past the alienation other members of so they're family, making the same choice that the children are making as far as looking at which parent We'll accept them later, right? Which is the weaker one or the one okay. The grandparents are making the same choice, right? And they, Absolutely. they yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, 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 it's shocking. And also our own siblings and our own family members do it, you know, and, and I had that personally as well. I've, I've got several people right now who, who are going through this and it often boils down to, you know, how they rank themselves within the family more generally, what they think their position is, how they want to kind of exercise that authority within the family. Um, others have, are jealous of us for whatever reasons. You know, if we've done better than them in, in certain aspects of our life, and now we're suddenly in a, a more weakened, vulnerable state, and they turn on us. It's, it's an opportunity for them to do us further damage. 
gosh, it's just so much hurt and so much pain. And it just tears me up. It just affects so many people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I mean, this, again, this, this comes down to why it's, why it's so challenging for us and why it's so important for us to be very, very mentally and emotionally yeah. resilient mm -hmm. for, for our, because if we're not, we, we can't help the people around us. We can't help our children. And also we can't help ourselves, mm -hmm. you know, and, and we are lovely people. We, we have to kind of say, I'm a good person. I should be allowed to get on with my life in a, in a good and positive way. Um, and that's why I say it's so, so important to help parents have permission. But also you, you kind of, part of that is, is looking at the world. I try to give people lots of kind of analogies because it, it helps them to kind of process this stuff better. Mm -hmm. And to imagine that there's two different universes, that there's the universe of you and there's the universe of your child. Mm -hmm. And imagine that they, these are two separate universes, that they're, they're, not, they're not joined. And in your universe, if you are sad, depressed, guilty, shameful, all those things that are negative, that is not going to do anything, as we were saying earlier, that is not going to do anything positive for your child because you're, you're coming across in completely the wrong way. And guess what? It's, it's, not, it's really bad for you. But if you're kind to yourself, if you are working on your self-confidence, if you're feeling good about you are a good person, if you're continuing to live, live your life and embrace your life because you should, that also is not going to have an impact on your kid, really, especially when you don't have contact with them. Mm -hmm. But it has an enormous impact on you. Mm -hmm. You know, so again, why would you do stuff that is only affecting you? Or why would you do things that are bad for you when they're only affecting you? But we do, we do, until somebody comes along and shakes us and goes, what the hell do you think you're doing? Why? <laughs> Break out of this, Go, you know, start doing things that are much better for you. Well, I have definitely been shaken today. And Charlie, I appreciate it. And I don't know about you, Mick, but I think that was, um, I got so many compliments there that I was a good mom within the hour, <laughs> that more than I've ever yeah. had. <laughs> you, you, you guys are brilliant and amazing. And what you're doing is brilliant and amazing, but you're both great people. And, and you know, sometimes you just need to remind yourself. Yes. Yeah, true. Well, thank you for reminding us today and listeners. And Charlie, the nine step program, how do people get in contact with Definitely. you? about it? Yeah. I know I was very interested in it. So I watched your intro video that you sent me, which was about 20 minutes. It explains it, which yeah. was fabulous. But how do they get in contact with you to get that? So the, the easiest way is if you go onto Facebook or Instagram mm -hmm. and you just search Charlie McCready, uh, I will pop up. Um, I've also got a group site which is empowering you to overcome alienating behaviors. But the, the easiest way is, is Charlie McCready and it'll lead you to all those things. And um, there are one of the other things that, that I do uh, is I provide daily posts. So there are two to three posts every day on Instagram. There's one to two posts on Facebook. They're really helpful for parents. I would advocate, uh, I'm not singing my own trumpet or blowing my own trumpet too much, but that they're insightful, they're thoughtful, they are there, and they're sometimes provoking, but they're there to help parents. And for anybody who's interested in doing the program, there are posts up, so you can DM me directly, I will always come back to you very quickly. I'll send you an overview. And as you, as you kindly said, Kendra, there's, there's a 20 minute um, video that basically takes you through all of the key things that you need to focus on and how the program helps you through that process. And what I've done is I've, I've taken a very compli complex area mm -hmm. and distilled it down and made it as easy as possible so that you literally have Okay, here's an easy step one, here's an easy step two, here's an easy step three to take you through this process, Start starting with kind of where are you today and then learning about your kids, learning about the alienators and re spending quite a lot of time focusing on you so that you're in a position that you're building your mental and your emotional resilience because only then can you really help your kids and your family and yourself. And I think... Um, two really good things that came out of that when I was watching it was 
a therapist, a life coach can only help you so much. Hmm. Doing something with someone like Charlie that has been through this, you know, Mick and I have been through it, but Charlie's leading the charge on this nine step program and he's been through it. So he hmm. has experienced it. He knows what he's doing. And I think just bringing that, simplifying it because sometimes we can go get so involved in, in our own situation and just bringing it back down to a level to understand and simplify. And you're doing it not just with Charlie, but with only three or four other individuals. This is not a large group type of setting overview one time thing, right? It's a very intimate setting where you get to know other parents and you can be vulnerable and, um, you know, admit mistakes or, you know, cry, I'm sure during the sessions and, yeah. and also celebrate little wins. Right. And so I thought that was very impactful. It's very unique. And I just, Charlie, I think it's a great thing you're doing. I absolutely love it. Thank, thank you. And, and so just, just to build very quickly on the, on the group side, that's so, well, two things, actually, when part of the challenge for the parents is that you're having to deal with different aspects. So some people will specialize on helping your child. Mm -hmm. Other people will specialize in helping you. Mm -hmm. Other people will specialize in dealing with narcissists. Mm -hmm. But actually, you have to do the three things together. And that, and that is part of kind of the uniqueness of the approach that we've taken. But also, I found that uh, in counseling people individually, whilst that's very helpful, being in a group is is it addresses the isolation that we've been through and there is something magical and very helpful being with other parents who are in similar situations you suddenly realize that we're all going through very similar experiences mm -hmm. you know regardless of, of how different and unique we think we are it all boils down to the same stuff and also when you see other people struggling to accept what's going on for instance and then then the penny drops and they achieve it it spurs everybody else along. And we also, what, what typically happens is that the, the program itself is eight weeks. Then we have a follow-up four weeks later and another follow-up another four weeks later. So I'm, I'm working with people for a four-month period. Is that those little communities continue meeting together over those couple of months. And some of them continue meeting for a much longer period. Uh, in fact, one of the groups I'm getting together with them uh, to celebrate the fact they're up to the six, six month mark in just a few weeks uh, because they found it really helpful because, you know, they're, they're all working on changing these, you know, different aspects of their life. And it's so helpful uh, when I'm not there to be able to turn around to people who've now become friends and say, oh, this happened to me this week, or I'm really struggling with this. Uh, and they all chip and support each other. It's really, really good. I think you have something definitely unique and very helpful to lots of people out there. So thank you, Charlie. It's been a pleasure having you on and you can always find Charlie at Charlie McCready on Facebook or Instagram. And thank you guys. It's, it, it's, I feel honored to be here. It's, it's so nice to be able to do something positive and helpful for, for anybody going through this experience. Yes. Absolutely. We need the positivity. So, if you want to continue having great guests like Charlie, because I learned a lot, I came out saying, is this really possible in nine steps? I'm a believer now. Hopefully everybody else jumps in as well too. But if you want to have more special guests like Charlie, you appreciate your time. Make sure that you are listening, liking, sharing, and positively reviewing the aftermath on Apple Podcasts. Until next time, we'll see you then. Deus vol.